live here from sunny Phoenix, Arizona, down in the Valley Beit Midrash office. My name is Eliyahu Friedman. This is the first time I've been teaching Torah on Facebook Live, so I'm excited. And to get things started, I thought that we could begin with a short meditation. So if you're comfortable, just close your eyes, see if you can straighten your back. Imagine a invisible string connecting top of your head to the sky, pulling, straightening the back a bit, and just relaxing. We'll sit for about 30 more seconds. Take a few deep breaths. Notice the air flowing in and out of the body. Notice the ground, the chair, the earth supporting you. Always being supported by something, by someone. And this kind of awareness will become especially relevant given today's topic. Well, speaking of today's topic, if you could pull up the sources which I've attached in the link, that will help you follow along. So I'm just going to outline the class briefly. So today's class is entitled Becoming Godly, Tomer Devora as a response to contemporary challenges in moral philosophy. So we're gonna begin by considering several challenges to the field, the academic field of moral philosophy. I did my bachelor's degree in philosophy at McGill University and I, and I studied especially moral philosophy. So it's, it's been a field that has interested me for a while. So we're gonna begin with some of the big challenges that people talk about in the academy. And we're gonna to transition to Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, which is a, a short book that I encountered a couple of years ago. You can read it in one afternoon if you had the ambition, or you could do it page by page for about a month. It's a, it's a short book, and it's a text that has stuck with me since I first encountered it, and I've now had the, the joy of learning it several times. And we're gonna look at a bit of it today and see how it can be brought into conversation uh, with some of the issues in moral philosophy. So without further ado, let's look at source one. Source one comes from Bernard Williams. Bernard Williams is an English moral philosopher, passed away um, just a couple of years ago, and he wrote several books attacking the state of moral philosophy, the field that he uh, worked in for his entire career. And one of his main attacks, his main critiques of the, the current discussion in moral philosophy um, has to do with Socrates' question. So if you look at source one, I'll read it. Socrates' question, which is how one should live. According to Williams, this is the, the question we should be asking. This is the best place for moral philosophy to start. If you spend time in an ethics class in the last number of years in, in the West, you might have begun with the question of what is our duty? This is a question that many people will associate with Immanuel Kant, very influential German philosopher, or contemporarily with John Rawls, a popular American philosopher. You might also ask, how may we be good? This kind of theory would, would be associated today with a guy like Peter Singer. If these names are uh, unfamiliar to you, um, I would recommend that these are good things to look into uh, on Google or at your local library. I'm not, unfortunately, not going to spend too much time by getting into those theories themselves. Um, but Williams advocates a much broader question, how should one live, right? And, uh, and I'm gonna argue that this is the kind of approach that Cordovero takes. Let's move on to source two. Okay, source two comes from Charles Mills. Charles Mills is a living philosopher I believe he writes um, the ethicist column right now for the New York Magazine. He teaches at CUNY in New York City. He did his PhD at University of Toronto, where I'm from. And Mills is, is one of the few black professors in philosophy. So he has a, a unique perspective. And uh, he grew up in Jamaica, if you look at Source 2. He's talked about how contemporary issues in his local Jamaica, such as issues of race and imperialism, you couldn't find appropriate philosophical frameworks in the predominantly white uh, philosophy departments where he studied um, and 
at University of Toronto, which which lacks a Black Studies program, at least it did when he was there. Um, Mills reports that only one percent of U.S. philosophers are Black, and he believes that that this huge um, disparity in who is producing philosophy has affected the content of the discipline. And so when you have so few professors coming from his background, it's not surprising that the social and political issues facing this community are absent. And so Mills believes that the approach to ethics, which um, begins with an impartial observer, right, uh, an abstract person, does not speak to his own experience um, as a marginalized person in our society. And that once you begin from his perspective, the kinds of questions that philosophy will focus on, especially with ethics, will be different. So he'll be asking about how do you respond to discrimination? Uh, how, what is it ethical when you're a person who is being marginalized? What does it look like um, essentially to respond to oppression? So this is really what Mills has, has dedicated his career to. He's written several books on the subject. And so I'm gonna ask, well, if we're reading Cordovero, a book that was written hundreds of years ago, how can he be read as a response to that? So we'll get to that at the end of the year. So turning to the subject of our mini class now, Rabbi Moshe Cordovero. And Moshe Cordovero was born in, we're actually not sure he was born, but he lived in Sfat. He, he was there in the, um, in the mid 17th century, I believe. I, if, you, if you look at the top of the year, you can find some more autobiographical information. And he was in the what, what we call the Safed circle of Kabbalists. So he studied, um, he was a teacher with the Ari and uh, many other very prominent Kabbalists. And he wrote uh, many books of Kabbalah as well, and the commentary on the Zohar, in addition to Tomer Devorah, which is his sort of ethical treatise. So if you look at source three on our sheet, you'll find the title page of this book. And in the title page, um, it says that what is this book about? It essentially states in one sentence, what is the objective of this goal? So he says, I'll read it in Hebrew and I'll translate. Uh, pamphlet, this is how I translate Ma'amar, it's a very short book, in the straight path that person seeks, man seeks, translate literally, his cognitive focus, Yitvoderuto, and the contemplation of his path. It's, it's my opinion that this is a way of answering Socrates' question. And thus, if we're going to take the challenge of Bernard Williams seriously, I believe that um, we can accept the challenge. It's a, it's a good one. And we can view Tomer Devora in light of the critique of Williams. This, this is a very general this is a book of guidelines on how to live. It's not asking a second order question that involves an abstract concept like duty or goodness. It's very basic, which um, some people, I'm of the opinion that that's a, a feature of this book uh, and of Greek approaches to ethics. Um, and if you're um, familiar, you'll notice that the expression here comes from Pirkei Avot, the classic book of Jewish ethics, Derech Yeshira Shiavor Lo Adam, and it's true that much of Tomer Devor has been influenced by uh, previous writings in the field of Jewish ethics, such as Pirkei Avot, but as we'll see in the next source, he has a very unique uh, way of, of getting to similar themes and answers and guidelines on how to live. Okay, I see we got a couple of people joining. Hi, Andrea. Okay, source four. Now we're getting into it. Tomer Devora, chapter one, paragraph one. I'll read it again in Hebrew. And these translations are coming from a great article by Patrick Koch. Hope I um, pronounced his name right. And the text is coming from a critical edition in Israel by an author named Sam. And there's a link to that above. Okay. Paragraph one. Ha'adam ra'ui shi'edameh lo'kono. Ve'az ye besod ha'tzura ha'elyonim selem u'dmut. It is proper for Adam, the generic name for a person, 
to resemble their creator. And then they will be in the secret of the supernal form, Tselem Udmut. Now, if you're familiar uh, with, with the, the Torah, um, you'll recognize that Tselem Udmut comes from the first chapter of the book of Bereshit. This is the description of God made humans in God's image, Tselem Udmut, so with form and likeness. It's hard to translate these two words, and that has become the basis of much of Jewish philosophy, the most famous, perhaps, translation of Tselem Udmut. What did it mean that God made humans in God's Tselem and God's Mut? The most, most well-known response, perhaps, would come from Maimonides, in the first chapter of the Guide for the Perplexed, Moran of the discusses what this means. And so everything written after Maimonides in Jewish philosophy can essentially be understood as a commentary or interpretation or response to Maimonides. So for Maimonides, Selimud's mood has to do with the intellectual perfection that humans are capable of and the capacity for reason and, uh, and uh, for thinking and for for um, intellectual perfection. But as we'll see, for Cordovero, he has a very different understanding of what did it mean to be created with God's Tselem or God's mood. I'm intentionally not translating it because we'll see what he means in the next, in the next few lines. She'ilu yedumei begufo velo be'peulot arei hu machsiv ha-tsura ve'yamru alav tsura na'e ma'asim ho'orim Okay, we'll break here to translate. For if a person's body, if only their body represents God, the creator, but they don't represent God, resemble God through their actions, this person distorts the form, and it is said about him, a handsome form and ugly deeds. Go back to the Hebrew. Um... For the principle of the supernal Tselem Admut are the actions. Okay, let's break from here and try and explain what's going on here. And if you're following the source sheet, you could read a, a lengthier explanation in the box. Basically, there's a familiar idea in Jewish ethics um, which is grounded in this notion that all humans are created in the divine image. This is how we translate it, Selim Elohim. Um, and what Cordovero picks up on is that there are actually two adjectives in Bereshit Aleph, in the first chapter of Bereshit, to describe how humans are created in the divine image, but also the divine demut. And so the way that Cordovero interprets uh, this description is by saying that our bodies were born it with the divine image. That's automatic, that we resembled God by virtue of being human. All human beings have a certain amount of resemblance of God. But what he says here about God, and this is really his, his big message, which he'll elaborate on in the book, and, and this is the message that I want everyone who's listening to take away, is that God is actually active. God has many actions. In the Hebrew, this is, Right, in English, the principle, the main feature of God and what the Torah is talking about, that we resemble God, is that we resemble God's actions. Right, So there's an element to which automatically, just by virtue of being a human being, we resemble God in some metaphysical way. Um, but Cordovero understands God as being active in the world. And we we ought to resemble God through our behavior, through our actions. And the rest of the book is going to explain how we do that. But I, I just want to pause for a moment to really think about the radical message behind this, this very basic teaching. So um, according to Cordovero, I'm a, I'm a person. I know that I have basic human dignity, right? But that's not enough. And this, this is what I take. I find to be inspiring about this book is it's not enough to wake up every morning and say, I have human dignity. Um, but I also need to remember that there is a divine um, 
there's a divine process where every day God is in the world. God is giving me sustenance. God is having compassion on me. And this is what it mean what it means to resemble God, according to, to Cordovero, to be in the divine image is to have the to mirror God's behavior. If God gives me uh, energy in the morning, then I need to go out there and give other people energy. If God forgives me, then I need to forgive people. And what Cordovero warns here is it's possible that we'll have one of the two elements of, of uh, resembling God, and to him he denigrates that that's not really good, right? It's not good to have basic human dignity, but to not act in a dignified, godlike way. This is where we get the title of the Shior becoming a godly, because for Cordovero, it's a process. We acquire the attributes of God by studying God, by noticing where do we interact with the divine in our lives, and then by adjusting our behavior accordingly. And if this is sounding a little bit confusing, maybe it'll help if we look at a specific example. So let's go to paragraph five in the source sheet. And this one I'll just read in the English because it's quite long. Okay, so for those who want, would like to look this up in the original text, um, we'll be, we're, ba we're, we're working off of a verse in, in, in the book of Micha, which is one of the later books of Tanakh. Um, but it's not essential to this class, but that's where this comes from. For the remnant of his inheritance, that's a, uh, a, that's a, a part of a quotation. Okay, so behold, God treats the Jewish people in this manner, saying, What shall I do with Israel? For they are my family. I share one flesh with them. They are the marriage partner of God, who calls them my daughter, my sister, my mother. So these are quotes from Psalms. This is as the rabbis explain, and as it is written, Israel, the nation related to God, Israel am kerovo, right, literally related to God. They are God's children. This is the meaning of the remnant of his inheritance, a phrase that implies a familial relationship, and in the end, they are his inheritance. What does God say? If I punish them, behold, it pains me, as it is written, with all their pain, it is painful to him, because we are family. This is, this is another proof text for this idea. And his soul was grieved by the anguish of Israel, because God does not tolerate their pain and insult, since they are the remnant of his inheritance. So, so now we turn from how God behaves to us, where our pain hurts, hurts God, and uh, this is how we, we reflect God's attribute into others. So to a person treat another. All Israel are related to each other, for their souls are all bound as one. Each Jew has a portion of the other soul and vice versa. Also for this reason, all Jews are responsible for one another because each of them literally possesses a portion of each other. When one of them sins, he harms himself, as well as harming the portion of himself that resides in the other, since he's connected to his part that is contained with his fellow. They're related to each other. Thus it is appropriate for a person to seek the benefit of one's fellow, showing him generosity of spirit. He should consider his dignity as dear to him as his own, for they are literally a single entity. Because of this, we are commanded, and you will love your fellow as yourself. Okay, I think that's enough. So basically, the way that this is working is, Cordovero notices the language describing Israel in the Tanakh as one of relation. So the way this works in Hebrew is the Hebrew word karov, kuf, resh, bet, has several meanings. One of them means that this is the people who are close to God, right? And that's that's probably the, the standard uh, translation of this verse, but he picks up on that. The, the same word can also be used as relation. So when, when the Tanakh says that God is close to us, karov, he translated as God has a relation to us, and therefore our pain hurts God, according to his interpretation of it, and God has, has mercy on us, right? And therefore, similarly, uh, for us to to emulate, to resemble God who has mercy on us, we need to have mercy on others, right? And so there's this reflection of God's behavior. And just going back to our previous source, what we were talking about, um, 
we can not live up to God's behavior and therefore we could fail to resemble God. Okay, so this, let's look at, we have a question here. So do you think that Rav Cordovero would argue that one can lose their Tzalem Elohim due into living a life of constant acts of cruelty? So, yes, I do think so. I do think that one can certainly fray, I, I understand it as a, a two-part process. And um, I've been translating it as, as basic human dignity um, and dignified behavior. So I do think, I do think that um, not only can you not live up to the complete resemblance of God in both form and action, my instinct is that the form, or sorry, the action can be so wrong as to distort the form. So I do think that there is a, a relationship between a behavior and essence here. Uh, that's something that uh, perhaps we could revisit if we studied um, the book further. I do think you would believe, though, in the, in the attribute that we were just talking about of, of being in a family relationship with all of Israel and with God. I do think there are ideas in Judaism of how one could be cut off uh, this is an expression that is in the in the Bible, in the Tanakh. Um, and there are different understandings of what you would need to do um, immorally to be cut off. Um, but I do think he would, he would believe that you can uh, lose your divine essence in addition to not living up to uh, the divine behavior that each of us is, is called to and really required to, to really resemble God completely and not just be a divine image, but to be people who are living as much like God as possible in the world. Okay, so there's been a lot of talk in this previous paragraph, paragraph five in the Sarshi, about Israel's familiar relationship with God and how our pain causes God pain. Now, if you're like me, um, you'll be wondering, okay, well, what if I'm not a part of Israel? Or what about God's relationship with other nations um, and so I have um, put uh, some ideas that I have of how we can understand Cordovero if we have more of a universal uh, worldview and we want to believe um, our philosophical uh, belief is that God has a relationship with all people fundamentally perhaps there's a special relationship with Israel um, but that God, A, has a relationship with other people, and since God has such a relationship, then we have a relationship to other people as well. And therefore, uh, as Jews, we, we have a, a similar moral responsibility to all humans. Okay, so my plan for addressing that question would be to examine Cordovero's proof text. So I'm on the final page of the online source sheet, and as I... Uh, mentioned above, the, the proof for Cordovero's claim that Israel has a relationship with God is from Psalms uh, Tehillim uh, 148.14, where it says that the people of Israel are close to God, right? And the, the, same, um, the same adjective for close can mean family. Okay, but if we just turn three chapters back in the book of Psalms, we'll see in chapter 145, that the very same expression is used. So it says that the Lord is close, karov, to all who call out to God in truth. All right, so I think that we could see here that um, it's the same language, so that not only does, if, if we're going to accept that God has a special relationship to Israel, a special closeness, because of chapter 148, we could, we could also say that according to chapter 145, God has a special relationship to all those that call out in truth. And my understanding of this really takes us back to Charles Mills, because I do believe, and, and I believe that in other uh, places in Tanakh, such as the fourth chapter of Kohelet, which I quote here, that, that God has a special relationship with those who are, are experiencing oppression. As you see in the first verse of, of Kohelet 4, I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of such as were oppressed, and they had no comforter. And on the side of the oppressors there was power, but they had no comforter. <laughs> so I do believe that um, when Mills, Charles Mills talks about the special ethical insight 
that comes from crying out of oppression. This, this really reminds us, uh, as Jews, it's very resonant with the story of the Exodus. And when does God uh, begin the process of liberation? When the Jews cry out. So there's, there's a <coughs> connection between crying out for help and receiving the help, and I, I find that to be inspiring. Um, so a way of, of reading this is that God has a special connection with Israel, but also a special connection with all those who are struggling, who are experiencing marginalization, who are crying out. And I would argue that the intersexual, intersectional reading of, of this passage would be that we have, a, we Jews, Jews have a unique closeness with God, right? Because of our experience in the world and our history. But similarly, each oppressed group has their own unique relationship with God because of their experience as a group and their history and their crying out. And for the same person, they could cry out for multiple reasons. So this, this could birth the intersectional, intersectional kind of connection. A person could cry out because of their racial background, their experience of, of marginalization for, for Charles Mills of being a Jamaican man studying philosophy, uh, but they could also cry out uh, because of, of their Jewish background and the experience that Jews uh, face and the, the difficult times that we've gone through historically and, and contemporarily. And for, for every other identity group that experiences this kind of marginalization that knows uh, what it feels like to need to cry out for help, um, that these people have a special uh, relationship to God and, and and that relationship to God, since God is comforting us, we, we live up to our potential, our full potential of um, being created in Selim Udzmut Elohim, the divine image and form by living up to the divine form and uh, doing divine behavior. Uh, and we just touched on that, being compassionate, and I hope that this will spur interest to go through the rest of Tomer Devora and see the other divine behaviors that we can emulate to really live up to our full potential. And um, just to reiterate, it's a short read, and you can go through one attribute a day. It's really the kind of book that lends itself well to constant reflection. It's very short, and uh, there's a lot of inspiration there. And I have my email on the source sheet if anyone has any questions, if they'd like to stay in touch. That would be great. So we're going to sign off here from Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you for making it to the end, and have a great day. Bye.